What is up, people? Welcome back. We've got a great topic today, government deficits and the national debt, or as I like to call it, the beginning of the end. Make sure to smash that like button and to subscribe while the music plays. Okay, so maybe I was being ever so slightly hyperbolic a moment ago, but you may be aware that the U.S. government has a, let's just say, sizable national debt. And that worries some people. This video explores how a government accumulates debt as well as some of the potential results. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning. In the US, Congress and the President are in charge of taxation and passing a federal budget each year. I'm sure that rings a bell and that you recognize that what we're talking about here is fiscal policy. Changes to the level of government spending, transfers, or taxation therefore affect the federal budget balance which refers to the difference between tax revenue and government spending and transfers. On the extremely rare circumstances when tax revenue is greater than government spending and government transfers, the federal government has a budget surplus. On the much more likely event that tax revenue is less than government spending and transfers, the government is running a budget deficit. By the way, we could also refer to this as a negative budget balance, just like we could also call a budget surplus a positive budget balance just in case you ever see those terms. The other option that's technically possible is a balanced budget in which tax revenue is exactly equal to government spending and transfers. For us, there's a couple important conclusions we need to draw. The most important being that expansionary fiscal policy moves the economy towards a budget deficit. Recall that expansionary fiscal policy involves some combination of tax cuts and increases in government spending and transfers. And these policies move the budget towards a deficit by reducing the money coming in, by increasing the money going out, or both. This isn't to say that this means expansionary fiscal policy should therefore never be implemented, but it is important to understand that there are trade-offs, and that one of the trade-offs associated with expansionary fiscal policy is budget deficits, and in turn, a larger national debt. The national debt refers to the total debt accumulated by the federal government, and it increases each time the government runs a budget deficit. Be very careful not to mix up debt and deficit. These terms get used incorrectly all the time and it drives me crazy. And you don't want to drive me crazy, do you? Deficits happen on an annual basis, while debt is the total amount owed that's the result of running deficits for years upon years upon decades. Think of a sink. If you turn the faucet on, the water that's coming into the sink represents the annual deficit, while the water that's in the sink represents the total debt. Even if I turn off the faucet and we stop running a deficit this year, we still have the water in the sink that's accrued from when the faucet was running. Got it? Good. And since we know that expansionary fiscal policy moves us towards a budget deficit, you could probably figure this out on your own, but I'll say it anyway. Contractionary fiscal policy moves the budget towards surplus, or at least a smaller deficit, since it involves some combination of increasing tax revenue or cutting government spending and transfers. As a result, even though some policymakers make a lot of hay out of talking about balancing the budget and decreasing the national debt, it's a really tough thing for them to actually have the will to do. And I realize that we're on the edge of politics over here, but I assure you that fiscal irresponsibility is very bipartisan. I remember a certain president who promised to eliminate the entire national debt during his term, and yet once he got into office, the national debt increased by over $6 trillion during his four-year term. But as you can see, there's nothing really unique about that. The debt increased by about $8 trillion over Obama's eight years and another $6 trillion during Bush's term. But here's the thing, this isn't about presidents and parties, and larger deficits may happen for reasons that aren't fully under the control of politicians. Additionally, there's the Keynesian school of thought that argues in favor of running large deficits during recessions to stimulate the economy and then paying down the debt during years of expansion. Politicians of all parties seem to have only really internalized half of that advice, though. Even still, if you recall in Unit 3, we learned about automatic stabilizers that kick in without any action by policymakers. When the economy is in a recession, they are expansionary, like increased transfers for unemployment, welfare, or food stamps. These expansionary stabilizers push the economy automatically towards a deficit. On the other hand, during expansions, stabilizers are automatically contractionary and push the economy towards a budget surplus. It's just something to keep in mind when looking at budget and national debt data before making comparisons that aren't particularly valid when presidents inherit very different economies. 
Now, the next question about the national debt is, who cares? Does it really matter? Now, different economists will answer these questions differently, but there are some things on which they can agree, and we can point those out here. For one, governments must pay interest on its debt. And I think we all understand that kind of intuitively. When you borrow from somebody, you get to spend the money today, but you owe them what you borrowed plus interest. It's the same for governments when they borrow money by selling treasury bonds. This matters because that interest itself adds to the national debt and represents money that can't be spent on any alternative use that we might prefer. For example, in 2022, the US government is projected to pay about $305 trillion in interest, or roughly 5% of its budget. This is to pay for the interest on money that we already owe, so it's not like we get anything new for this. And you can see the projections from the CBO about these values increasing significantly over the next decade. I'll just briefly point out that the US national debt has been growing more and more rapidly, and that all of this discussion has left out implicit liabilities, which are technically not counted as debt, even though they are promises of future payments, mostly in the form of Social Security and Medicare spending. Estimates of just how large the implicit liabilities are range from 50 to $200 trillion, which really makes that $30 trillion debt seem small in comparison. Ultimately, though, the national debt will be felt in the form of increased taxes in the future, increased future inflation, or a significant reduction in government services. It's just a math question, and this isn't sustainable, but so it goes. All right, that's it for 5.4, but we're going to stay right here for 5.5. When a government has a budget deficit, it borrows to finance its spending. For example, in 2021, according to the CBO, the federal government spent $6.8 trillion, took in $3.8 trillion in revenue, leaving it with a $3 trillion deficit, which it then had to borrow in the form of treasury bonds in order to close that gap. Let's look at a loanable funds model to see what happens. Just a quick review of this model, the supply curve represents savers and the demand curve represents borrowers. And I'm gonna be honest with you, depending on which textbook you look at, some draw what we're about to do by shifting the supply curve and others shift the demand curve. And either one is totally fine and both are acceptable on the AP exam. I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the way I taught you in unit four, which means I'm gonna be using the supply curve. Again, a little bit more review is required. The supply curve represents national savings, which includes both public and private savings. Public savings is another way to say the budget balance. When the federal government runs a budget deficit, public savings are therefore negative. So a budget deficit shifts the supply curve to the left. The important thing is that this results in a higher real interest rate and in turn, something known as crowding out. Crowding out refers to the fact that the increased borrowing by the federal government has pushed up the real interest rate, crowding out private investment spending. Recall that businesses are more likely to borrow money to engage in investment spending when interest rates are lower because the dollars are cheaper and it promises them a higher rate of return. So when interest rates are forced higher as a result of increased government borrowing, some private investment spending that would have taken place is now crowded out and no longer takes place. There are two main consequences of this crowding out. One is that it makes expansionary fiscal policy less effective than it would otherwise be. The goal of the policy is to shift AD to the right, but since investment spending decreases, the crowding out causes a smaller than intended shift of the AD curve. In fact, depending on how sensitive AD is to the higher real interest rate, it's possible that the decrease in investment spending could offset the entire increase in AD. By the way, you wouldn't be asked to draw this, so don't worry about that, but you should definitely be prepared to answer questions about this. Milton Friedman and the Monetarist pointed this out and argued that if the Fed didn't increase the money supply in conjunction with expansionary fiscal policy, that the fiscal policy would be much less effective than intended. An even more important long-run impact from crowding out stems from the decrease in investment spending which can be hugely consequential because investment spending is the primary driver of economic growth. You might recall from Unit 2 that investment spending refers to purchasing new physical capital, including machines, tools, technology, and new construction. So if crowding out causes a decrease in investment spending, we could potentially see a lower rate of capital accumulation and in turn, less economic growth as a result. And that's a big deal. It's an easy consequence to sleep on, but it's obviously very significant and something to keep in mind when it comes to the consequences of budget deficits. 
All right, well, that's it for this one. Next up, economic growth. Can't wait. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and to ring that bell. And check out the description for a link to the answers to the practice questions, as well as the unit notes and a great review book I've written for you. And I will see you in the next video.